Welcome to the Reality Revolution. Today we're reading a powerful Neville Goddard lecture. This one was delivered on November 19th, 1965. What are you sowing? This goes into the imagination and asks the question, what are you sowing? What is it that you're thinking about and dreaming about in this world? And are you seeing it manifested all around you? Neville Goddard was an amazing mystic and lecturer that taught about the Bible, spirituality, and documented his own unique awakening. And I continue to find incredible nuggets of information in every one of his lectures that I read. What are you sowing? Tonight's subject is what are you sowing? We're told in scripture, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that also will he reap. Galatians 6-7 Here we have the law of identical harvest. As you sow, so you reap. And the harvest is always the multiplication of the identical seed. We are told, while the earth is yours, seed time and harvest shall not cease. Genesis 8.22 Now tonight, you be the judge of the seed that you will plant. I'll try to show you how to plant it. You have to feel the feeling in your mind. You plant it right here. It may not be cultivated, not be prepared to receive the seed, but you can pick the seed and then plant it. Now the individual himself must accept the burden of the incarnation of his dream. The dream is always ready to be incarnated, but unless we ourselves offer it human parentage, it is incapable of birth. It can't be born of itself. It has to be born through man. So when Blake spoke of the combats of good and evil as eating of the tree of knowledge and the combats of truth and error were eating of the tree of life, he said, there isn't an error in the world that it has a man as its agent. That is, it is a man. There isn't a truth, but it has as its agent a man. Therefore, it is man. So man is not only the field, he is the sower. He selects the seed and then he plants it on himself. And whatever he plants, he is going to bring forth if he doesn't modify the seed. He'll bring forth, well, 30, 60, or 100 fold if he accepts it. Completely, he'll bring 100 fold if he modifies it because he can't quite believe in such a vast dream coming true. Well, then he'll modify it. He'll bring forth according to what he has accepted as true. So you and I take a dream, a daydream. I would like to be, and I name it, this, that, or the other. And then I toy with the idea. What would it be like? What would the feeling be like if it were true? You mean that that is true? Well, I'm going to try to persuade myself that it is true. And to the degree that I am self-persuaded, I have planted it. Have I modified it? I might have. I might have thought it is too big, much too big. So all I can do is acquaint you with the principle. I leave you to your choice, and quite often, it's risk. I say this advisedly for here, just recently, this is the end story. This lady, well, many years ago, she came every Tuesday, every Friday, and when I spoke on Thursday, every Thursday never failed. She had no money, very little. She was the poor member of a very large family of wealthy people. Her next door neighbor would bring her to my meetings and she came every Tuesday, every Friday, and quite often her neighbors would pay for her. My friend's husband said one day, oh, the best thing in this world that could happen, calling the lady by name, is that if one of these rich members of her family would give her $20,000, if they'd only give $20,000. Well, my friend said to her, you go to Neville, I go to Neville, let's try it. Just let us apply this teaching. So they just simply applied the teaching to the end that she, this lady, had a lot of money. Didn't actually confine it to $20,000, just money, lots of money. Well, within a year, a member of the family died and left her $600,000. But may I tell you, she has no friends today. She is miserable. The first thing she did was this. She stopped coming to the meetings. 
She said, Neville may want some of the money. He'll find out sooner or later that I have money. She used to go to Christian Science, Unity, Science of Mind, Divine Science, and Self-Realization. She said, I'll not go to any of them because they'll find out and they'll all have their hooks out to get my money. She practically locked the door on herself. No one comes to see her and she lives this life of a hermit. So the other day, my friend, knowing how sad she was, how miserable, invited her over. They sat down together to discuss her members of the family that she now has it against, suspicious of everyone. So my friend said, now you did go to Neville. You haven't forgotten what he teaches. Let us now start from scratch. What do you want? You have your money, $600,000. You can't spend the interest here. You are well advanced in years. So let us now sit down and work out a plan that you want. The relationship that you want with your family, with your friends, before my friend could go any further. She said to my friend, if you're so darn smart, why don't you have money? Here's my friend who took her to the meetings, paid for her, did all these things, so the book was closed. She went back to her little home, put the key in the door, and there she stayed, dry rotting. So you want money. At that price, you can have it. You may have it. You can have anything in this world that you want. You contemplate something, contemplate it always along with its consequences to yourself and to others. If you contemplate it and it seems pleasant, but you don't take into consideration the consequences, well, you may go ahead on and get it. And then you have to live in misery. There's no reason why someone with $600,000 or a million dollars shouldn't be happy if they know how to live. But she became fearful and suspicious and she builds this suspicion day after day. I'll tell you, suspicion carried too far is diagnostic of insanity, so she won't be able to enjoy it. Because eventually, if she continues the suspicion, it will take her out. For her own good, it will be simply put into the hands of some members to be her guardian. So I warn you, try it. You can have anything that you want if you are willing to assume the burden of the incarnation of it. If you are willing to be the parent of the thing you desire in this world, for you and you alone will bring it into birth. You dare to assume that you are the man that you want to be, that you are the woman that you want to be, and then you see the world as you would see it, were it true. Look into your mind's eye and see a world that would reflect the friends who would see you. How would they see you? Others who are merely acquaintances, they would know of these new values that came into your life, and they would recognize in you the embodiment of these new values. Let them all see you in your mind's eye, just as you would be seen by the world were this dream of yours already embodied. You try it, and you'll know what it means in Scripture to go forth and sow. The ultimate word in Scripture is the Gospel. That is called the word of God, the word of salvation. But it's the same process of planting. That word had to be heard. Man had to hear the word. If he heard a distortion of the word, he will grow that. If he hears the word as it really is from one who has experienced the word, he may not accept the entire thing. But to the degree that he accepts, he'll bring it into this world. I am here to send you the word or plant the word or hope to plant it, for I am speaking from experience. I'm not theorizing. When we are told in Scripture, and the child to be born of you will be called holy, the Son of God. That's the Revised Standard Version of the Bible. The King James Version, it is not child. That holy thing to be born of you must be called holy, the Son of God. Well, the word translated holy thing in one Bible and child in another is the Greek word logos. Look it up in your concordance, just logos. Look up the word logos and get its true definition. We have it as word. In the beginning was the word, that's logos. And the word was with God and the word was God, John 1.1. 1, 1. But the word logos means meaning divine expression. It really is the gospel itself. It was in the very beginning, it was God. So if you hear the word as it really is and you accept it, you have accepted God. You've planted him on the inside and God has to grow in you in a series of mystical experiences. That is the way of salvation. 
that only union with Christ would ever lead anyone to God the Father. Well, Christ is simply the way of salvation, but personified in Scripture as a child. Never see him in any other light, just a child, an infant wrapped in swaddling clothes. Because when it begins to unfold within you, you'll find the infant wrapped in swaddling clothes. It happens so beautifully, all within you, the very field where you planted it is your own wonderful skull. So one scene after the other comes out and here you encounter the word unfolding like a flower. And everything said of Jesus Christ in scripture you will experience as a personal first person experience. Then you will know who Jesus Christ really is. So the word of God is God himself along the way you heard it. You either heard it from someone who experienced it or you heard it from one who rationalized it, therefore modified it or you heard it by reading the book itself, getting inspirational and extracting the meaning of the word. If you successfully extracted it and toyed with the idea to the point of acceptance, well then it's planted. Then that vision that you accepted has its own appointed hour. It ripens, it will flower. The whole thing will simply come into bloom. If in the meanwhile it seems long wait, it is sure and it will not be late. Habakkuk 2.3 Not late, from the time that you accepted it to the time of fulfillment. For you do not know when, really, you heard the word and accepted it. I hope that if you haven't heard it and you hear it tonight, don't reject it, toy with it. The sower went forth to sow. Some fell on the highway, took no root. Some among thorns came up quickly and was stifled by the cares of the world. Then some on rocky ground, not well prepared ground. Then some on fertile field. But even that brought forth only 30, 60. And then, of course, they did bring forth a hundred. But many could only bring forth 30, and many brought forth 60. Matthew 13, 3. So the word of God, which we are called upon to plant, is that eventually this series of events will break the cycle of recurrence, this repetition. And this will make it then possible for you to escape from this time-space prison, really, for we are all imprisoned in this world of time and space. And the only exit is through this series of events called in Scripture, the life of Jesus Christ. His life starts with His resurrection, and His resurrection is your resurrection. You'll know exactly what it means in the Bible that Jesus is resurrected from the dead, the first fruit of those who slept. And the word sleep is wisely used because when you feel it and you begin to awaken, it's the sensation of waking. You have no sensation of rising from the dead. You have the feeling of actually awakening. Then you are completely awake in a way you've never been before. But the death scene is now where you find yourself. You will awake, completely awake, to find yourself in a tomb. The tomb is your skull. That's the only moment in the whole drama that you know you must have died, or someone thought you did, for you find yourself in a sepulchre, in a tomb, and that tomb is your skull. So we are told in scripture that this birth of man is the result of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, 1 Peter 1, 3. You see, no one but yourself. So now you know who he is. Then you come out and you look at this thing out of which you've just emerged, and then the wind comes. And you find the symbol spoken of in Luke as the little child. The little child is the word. That is the meaning of the unfolding picture. You come out and you look at this thing out of which you've just emerged. And then the wind comes. An unearthly wind possesses you. Well, the wind is the spirit. Same word in Greek and Hebrew. It completely possesses you. When you look back, this out of which you emerged is gone. So the tomb now is empty. But in its place, here are the witnesses to the event. One finds the little infant and designates the infant as your child. You're the one who not only rose, you're the one who came out being born. So you are the one that's born. Then you go from that scene to the scene of the discovery of the fatherhood of God. From that scene to the scene of the ascent into heaven in the same manner that Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, the cutting of the temple door or the curtain of the temple, that all happens in you, right through to the very end. 
when the seal of approval is put upon you, then you know what the Word is. In the beginning was the Word, God's intention, His plan, His meaning. But it has to be told, so it's told to unnumbered people in the world. Not everyone receives it. It's the most incredible story in the world. Some will receive it wholeheartedly, others will modify it, take it under consideration, and they bring it in in a lesser production. So I say here on this level, you take the greatest story ever told, which is the story of the gospel, and just toy with it. Try to accept the whole thing. I'm telling you the truth. I'm speaking from experience. I'm not theorizing. And then take the same thing on a lesser level and beautify your world. Become the bigger man. Don't equate success and spirituality and lots of money and all these things with the word. No. That's what my friend's friend did. She thought that spirituality, power, wisdom, all these things she now possesses, she thinks because she has $600,000, don't do it. You just take the word on this level and ask a friend, what do you want in this world? Anything. Don't be embarrassed. All you're going to do is plant the seed. So they tell you, I would like to be this, that, or the other. Let it come within your code of decency that you wouldn't hurt the hair on one man's head to bring about his good fortune. But you don't have to. You just simply single out what you would like to be. And then in your own mind's eye, plant it. You assume the burden of the incarnation of that state. Do for him what he is either unwilling or unable to do for himself by simply listening to what he wants and persuade yourself that he has it. To the degree you are self-persuaded that he has it, to that degree he'll reflect it. He'll get it. You take no praise for it. You are simply exercising a very simple principle as we find it in scripture. And so you can go about doing good. You don't burden yourself with it. You don't lift a finger to make it come to pass. You don't get on a wire and call friends and ask them to help you out. You do nothing but plant the seed and the seed will grow in you and you will see them reflecting that growth in you. They'll become the embodiment of the man or the woman that they want to be. So this is what I mean when I ask the question, what are you sowing? For every little imaginal act is a seed planted if you accept it. But as I said earlier, that which was sown is not invariably brought to pass, but that which is brought to pass must have been sown. The reason why I say it is not invariably brought to pass you and I practice the art of forgiveness, which is called in scripture repentance. If you know that this day in my idle moments, I was unlovely in my thinking concerning you or anyone else. If I remember it, I can bring it back and revise it. I can practice the art of repentance and therefore addle the seed and it will not come into my world. I planted it, but then I dug it up. If I dug it up and destroy it, well then it can't or I can modify it, leave in the lovely parts and change certain parts and bring about a repentance or forgiveness so that it need not come. So don't be afraid. Our God is a God of forgiveness. As we are told in the 130th Psalm, I think it is that if you are not a God of forgiveness, who could stand, verse three, who in this world could stand if you are not a God of forgiveness? But he is. And yet, without forgiveness, the world seems to be so cruel. Just response. The whole vast world is infinite. Response. To the pure, you show yourself as pure. And to the crooked, you show yourself as perverse. Well, if that's the hard and fast law, like the law of cause and effect, there must be some escape. Repentance is the escape. You can change your attitude towards life, and having changed it, you will change the effects in your world. Everything in this world is simply response. It's an echo of what we have done somewhere along the way. So tonight, you can take it, just like this lady. But you might say, after all, she did have rich relatives. And everyone stops right there. She had rich relatives, and I don't have any, therefore, where would I get $600,000? That question should have been asked by John D. Rockefeller. He didn't have a nickel. Neither did Henry Ford I. Henry Ford II, he had a foundation of $2 billion. He didn't earn one penny of it. 
This money was earned by the old man who started off broke at the age of 40. He was a watchmaker and went broke. So don't say, well, I have no one in this world who I can turn to because all my relatives are poor. You don't need rich relatives. You don't need anything in this world but the seed and the willingness to plant it. You have the field. The field is your mind. So if you know that the harvest will always be identical with the seed, you can forget the harvest once you know what the seed is. The seed is simply the word, and the word is simply meaning. It may take a hundred words to describe what you want in this world. Well, put them all together, it forms one word or seed. So extract the meaning from the long sentence and plant it. Suppose someone would say to you tonight, Oh, I heard the most marvelous things about you, and you didn't die in shame, but you admitted it. And what they said would imply tremendous good fortune for you. Suppose they said it. But you will say, but that would be false. It isn't true. May I tell you, falsehood is prophetic. You don't have to confine yourself to the facts of life. If man had to confine himself to the facts of life, he could never transcend himself. So a true judgment need not conform to the facts to which it is related. I can say of you, oh, so you're so wealthy. If you want to be wealthy, don't say to me, oh, I'm not. Instantly you deny it. Give me the privilege of saying you are secure and security being a relative term. What would you mean by secure? Maybe you owe so much money you can't see your way out of it. Nevertheless, I accept the fact that you are secure, that you are wealthy and live in that assumption as though it were true. If you do, the seed goes down it takes root in its own good time it comes up and then you'll reap the harvest the harvest will be identical with the seed that seed was that you are secure if that's what you want if you want a companion if you want friendship no matter what you want all right take the seed there are seeds for every occasion in the world and everything will grow out of the mind of man for all things exist in the human imagination all things so tonight we don't dwell on the ultimate word but just on the word of this level you want a better job you know exactly what you would do had you the job there's a friend of mine in new york city he'd never worked for more than ten thousand a year he came to my meetings he couldn't raise the sights too high he was an engineer helping out with building of bridges all over this country came from the almost the far west not quite but he landed in new york city he and his wife and daughter came to the meetings. He said, Neville, I would like to make 15000 a year. I said, all right. You put the figure at $15,000. Yes. Well, where would you like to work? There's a firm on Madison Avenue, and I don't know that they need anyone. If they could use my services, and I'm willing to travel. They do things all over the world. They have plans now for a bridge in Turkey, eventually a bridge in Greece, and I'm willing to travel, but I want 15000 a year. I said, have you seen the inside of the office? Yes. Do you know of any place in that area where you would sit, where you'd hang your hat, hang your coat? Yes, I know exactly where I would sit if I had a job for 15000 a year. I've gone into the place and I've cased the joint. I said, all right, you take the elevator now. These stores would not be on the first floor. It's all merchandise. So you take the elevator to some floor. He said, I know exactly where I'd go. So he took the elevator in his imagination, called the number to the operator and went up. It stopped. He got off, went to the door, went over to the place and put up his little hat. In one week, he was working for that store, that firm at $15,000 a year. His first assignment came back, was with the store for about five years. That is the company for five years. Then one morning, he just didn't wake, didn't wake in this world. He was a healthy man my age and i'm going back now 15 years he just simply didn't wake perfectly wonderful healthy fellow but he knows the working of god's law so wherever he was after that wherever they sent him i hope he hasn't forgotten how it worked here because we don't get off this time space circle until we reach the fabulous series of events when the word of god unfolds within us the real world which is the gospel then we break the spell and we completely escape from this predicament of time and space. Wherever he is now, it's like a closed circuit 
and you can make your exit now at this moment to find yourself not in the year 1965 elsewhere, but in the year 3000. You think 3000 doesn't exist? We're coming upon it. That's only the linear concept of life. This is, and there's nothing new under the sun. That which has been is, and that which will be is, and there is nothing new under the sun. Ecclesiastes 1.9 So within this fabulous sphere, we can pick anything. Yet the modern concept of our world is that we cannot conceive as well. Even the turn of the century conceived that the future is always unfolding out of the past. He said, no, we must conceive the whole vast time space as already laid out. And we only become aware of increasing portions of it. The whole thing is, and I become aware. Well, become aware of yourself as being wealthy. Become aware of yourself as being wanted. Become aware of yourself and you name it. Because it is so. Everything is so. But if you don't assume the burden of the incarnation of this new value you sow, it remains forever unseen by you. So you are the sower spoken of in scripture. You have freedom of choice to single out any seed you want to plant. You have the soil, your own mind, and you can simply drop it, knowing it contains within itself the power and the plan of self-expression. You don't have to do a thing about it after you plant it. On reflection, reason will step in and will tell you it happened because, and then you go through the entire series of events that led up to the embodiment of it. You might be inclined to believe that's true. If these things had not happened, then I would not have had a good fortune smile upon me. A man looks and he sees a name. He doesn't like that name. That name represents to him the men who tried to dethrone his father to make him walk in the gutter and robbed him in this man's eye of all he possessed. Instead of seeing the man's name, he saw his father's name, which happens to be his name, and so he saw his father's name implying ownership of that building. Didn't have a nickel. Did it for two years, planting the seed until there was complete acceptance. In the interval, that firm went broke and the building is up for sale. The day of the sale with no money at all, not a penny. A stranger comes into the building. A stranger in the sense he was never in the man's home for a cup of tea and he said to him, kiddingly knowing he didn't have any money, he said, are you going to buy the building? He said, with what? Well, he said, would you like to buy it? He said, I'd love it. Well, he said, I have money. I've been watching you and your father and your hard workers and honest people and so I have money. It gives me nothing in the bank. Are you willing to give me just a note? No collateral because you don't have it. Give me just your signature and your father's signature and with the promise to pay 6% on it and reduce the principal in 10 years. Every year it must be reduced. At the end of 10 years it must be completely reduced. And you pay me 6% on the remaining monies until completed. He said, yes, that day this man owned the building, didn't have a nickel. That's 1924. I just heard from this man since that beginning in 1924. He bought properties here, properties there, properties all over. He just sold one for $990,000. That's just one piece. He sold one last year for $840,000. He has properties all over. One went up 600% and he sold it. And there is no capital gains tax where he lives. This is a man who had nothing, but he believed this principle. He started from scratch. He simply saw what he wanted to see persuaded himself that he was reading a name that wasn't there at all. Well, if the name were there, it would imply ownership by his family. So there, he simply believed what he imagined was so. Therefore, I tell you, from experience, imagining creates reality. Be careful what you imagine. Most of us are planting the most horrible seeds in the world. Nightmares. But one thing be assured, you, the dreamer, as he was the dreamer, the daydreamer, because what he was seeing and what was seen, it was a controlled waking dream, a daydream. But no matter how horrible the dream, the dreamer can never be destroyed by his dream. The dreamer is immortal. The dreamer can come into being and simply exhaust itself, or you can change it, go in to another dream. But the dreamer can never be destroyed by his dream. That's comforting. Therefore, it gives you all the freedom in the world, in this world of Caesar, to even have a nightmare, knowing that one day you'll awaken from it and pledge not to repeat it.
but he never lost the vision. I can say of him as Blake said of Los, he kept the divine vision in time of trouble. He never wavered. And so today he listens to all the arguments. It never sinks in. He knows exactly what he wants. So he took all the family into the business with him. Gave them all partnerships. That is, his father did. He didn't want any more than he had, but he said, one thing I want to have and I insist on having, I make all decisions and no arguments. They're all of you. You can tell me anything. I will listen, but the final decision is mine and mine until the day I die. No elections, no displacement. This is my child from birth. I share it with you, so you all share it, and you'll have opinions, but it is my child. The child in my attention, and for the rest of my earthly days, I and I alone make all decisions. You see him sitting in a chair. He isn't asleep. He's dreaming, a controlled waking dream. He knows what he wants. I knew when I was home two years ago, he wanted to sell that piece of property. You see him sitting alone. All of a sudden, a man comes from Europe, makes him an offer, $990,000, and he takes it. And that's the way he lives in this world. Doesn't consult with others, just sits down in dreams, controlled, waking dreams, knowing that, well, if he makes a mistake, he made a few, but they all, on reflection, panned out. And they were not mistakes. They were not mistakes. Here's a simple one. He bought six diesel engines from, I would say, the stock market. They were all built during the war for submarines. So they had stock of diesel engines unused, all crated. He bought six. We wondered, what did you buy six diesel engines for? We don't need one. But he bought six. Became a quarry. Using the diesel engines, but it didn't really work. Then one day, you couldn't get parts and the entire island was blacked out. In New York City the other day, only they could get repairs in 10 hours. We were in darkness for a month at the height of the tourist season. The only power in the island were his six diesels. So what did he do? He rented them out. This hotel wants one. It's powerful enough to take care of three hotels. And you pay me so much a month. The newspaper wanted one. The cold storage wanted one to keep the cold storage going big enough to supply both. The banker wanted one, another one there. At the end of the month of distress, he not only redeemed all of the money he paid for the six, but made a profit. So it really wasn't a fiasco to begin with. It seemed so when they began to dig the quarries, but then came the blackout. Who made the blackout? That's what William Butler Yeats asked. He said, I will never be sure that it was not some woman treading in the wine press that started that subtle change in men's minds. She's all alone and she's annoyed. And she's just lost in an angry mood, changing the affairs of the world. So here, he's not going to take a loss. Doesn't believe in taking a loss. And so I ask who caused the blackout. On the surface, the big generator broke down and they couldn't get the spares in time. So the island was blacked out at the height of the tourist season. So what would you do? He had six diesels. If you learn to dream as he dreams, you would grow rich overnight, if that's what you want. But I have seen so much sorrow from great wealth and such sordidness. I personally don't want any part of it. I've seen such sordidness in wealth. You think behind that facade they must live beautifully. Just put your ear this way and you'll hear what goes on behind and no decent person wants it. Yet we have to live in the world of Caesar and we need money. Therefore take this wonderful principle and apply it wisely. Apply it towards the kind of fruit that you want to feed upon in this world of Caesar. At the end of these lectures, Neville would give two minutes of silence followed by questions and answers. Now, let us go into the silence.
before I take the questions, I must share with you a little experience of last Tuesday night. This very sensitive soul comes here. She's an aunt. And when we went into the silence, we were discussing the states that displeases God. One is lack of faith in I am he. And the other is eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They're the only two states mentioned in scripture that could ever displease God. Nothing else displeases him. So when we went into the silence, she said to herself, I am he. Then she said, I heard a voice ever so clearly and it said to me, leave it alone. It is true. She said, it was a clear as a bell. This voice that spoke after I made the affirmation, I am he. She wrote it out and gave it to me last Tuesday night. I think it's a thrilling experience for anyone. But she shared with me that wonderful experience. That's why I ask you to share with me your experiences. Now, before I took the platform tonight, this husband told me that his wife has two of the most startling experiences on the working of the law. She hasn't given them to me as yet, but she's here and she knows what I am talking about. So I'm going to ask you to please write them for me that I may share them with those who come here because our faith encourages their faith and we're all mutually benefited if I can just tell you the story as it actually happened. Don't embellish it. Don't add to it. Just what you had as an objective, what you did, how you applied the principle, and then what resulted, that I may take this platform and tell it. So I'm going to ask you, having heard it from your husband, not the story, the exciting news that you can tell. Now, are there any questions? Question? Blank? Should you do anything physical to blank? Neville says, my dear, I am speaking here of a creative act. When you sit down and become self-persuaded that the unseen state is real, knowing full well that all of the seen comes from the unseen anyway, as we're told in the fourth chapter, the 17th verse of Romans, and he calls that which is not seen as though it were, and the unseen becomes seen. We are told it in the 11th chapter of Hebrews that the visible world comes out of the unseen world, verse 3. So you sit down and you're doing what to the world is unseen. That is God's creative act. Well, a creative act on this level, you don't interfere with it. You will bring about a miscarriage. There is no such thing as a little bit of pregnancy. Just leave it alone. Then all of a sudden you are very surprised, and I hope beautifully surprised, when the child is presented. But what could anyone do in the interval? No one goes into the field and draws up the seed every morning to see if it's really taken root. A little child could do that, and you tolerate him, but not the farmer. Question. Neville, when you said the two things that didn't please God, I didn't understand the second statement. Neville says, you're told in scripture only two states could ever displease God. The first is the lack of faith, and I am he. You're told that in the eighth chapter of John, you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am he. Verse 24. It's stated in the third chapter of Genesis, where they didn't believe. They disbelieved and ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You're told in the 11th chapter of Hebrews that without faith it is impossible to please him. Verse 6. No matter what you do in this world, if it isn't done in faith, it doesn't please him. So do it in faith. I will assume that I am and I name it. In confidence that it will be done. As we brought out last Tuesday night, quoting the 37th Psalm, take the light in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Verse 4. It's a gift if you delight in the Lord. Well, how do I delight in the Lord? He defines himself as I am. When we're told in Genesis that he breathed the breath of life into Adam, Adam became a living soul. Well, the word breath is the same as spirit, same as wind. Therefore, if he breathes his breath into me, he is in me. Can't be some other place. He is in me. Take away my breath, And what happens to me that's life well now he's going to transform me from a living being into a life-giving spirit so he breathes into me his breath is his spirit and the spirit of god is in you his name is i am exodus 3 14 therefore lack of faith in i am he and say i am is the fundamental sin i'll keep on sinning and sinning or missing my mark in life unless i believe that i am he the man that i have assumed that i am So you can't please God without faith. That's what we're told in scripture. Having experienced scripture, I can't go back to any other state. My platform is the platform of one who has experienced scripture. 
I'm a witness to the truth of God's word. And this concludes What Are You Sowing by Neville Goddard. Some interesting new aspects that we get from this lecture. I believe this is the first time I've heard him refer to our experience on earth as a prison. He's definitely referred to the limitations of this world and that it's a furnace, that it's hell. He's referred to it in those regards, but he's also said that it's a schoolroom. But here he says that it's a prison of time and space and the only way to escape is through experiencing the promise. We also get some additional details from his brother in the ways that he was imagining and making money. We haven't got those specific details, at least in the lectures that I've read on the channel so far. But the key thing is, we have a very subtle discussion of generating and manifesting wealth using the imagination. And as Neville oftentimes does, he explains, it's not all it's cracked up to be. I've had people say, well, Brian, if Neville Goddard was so good at imagining, why wasn't he a billionaire? Well, the answer is in this lecture. He is stating that there's some downsides that seem to come up when you become wealthy. And he gives the example of the woman that manifested $600,000 and then forced herself to live alone in her house and didn't want to go out into the world. She didn't trust anybody. So you want to imagine receiving the money in a divine and wonderful way so that it's not a burden or it can have any sort of negative effect, which is often what happens when people are just about the dollar amount. I need this 102,000 right now. And they're not imagining that it benefits others, that it's helpful, that it's coming in a positive way, that you're not violating any laws. So you need to be very accurate with how you imagine receiving the money that you get. We all need money in this world to survive. So we can use this technique very powerfully to receive the money that we receive. And we also want to receive it in the proper ways. So we're not breaking the law and it's of benefit to others. And if we do that, and if we become masters of our imagination, we can receive enough for us to live happily and that is the point that he continually tries to make. The key here is that the seeds that you plant need to take root. You are the field and the seed, and the seed will not take root if it's planted on the highway or on the rocks. The field needs to have soil, which is rich in nutrients, that allows for the seed to blossom. And that field is your subconscious mind. And if you're constantly thinking negative thoughts, and looking at negative material and complaining about the world, then that will come back to you. The field will not allow for the seeds that you want to grow and blossom. Neville has a warning here. It's the state of suspicion. When you're suspicious of everyone, which is fairly natural in this world because we're constantly being scammed and spammed, we have to remind ourselves not to be fearful and suspicious in the process of imagining the wealth that we want. As he says, suspicion carried too far is diagnostic of insanity. So you're not going to be able to enjoy what it is that you manifest. So check yourself. Are you overly suspicious? Because that will start to affect your imaginings. So my question to you is, what are you sowing? Let me know in the comments. Sow something lovely and wonderful. That's all I can say. You want to continue to sow wonderful things now that you are aware that your imagination creates reality. And I'm imagining all the joy and love and happiness coming to you. I'm imagining the most wonderful life and everything working out perfectly for you. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. I highly recommend you go to the Neville Goddard playlist on the channel. Start at the beginning. If you haven't ever heard of Neville Goddard, but you'll find some amazing lectures and so many different topics have been covered so far and we have so many more to go. You might really enjoy my art website. You can find it at www.newearth.art. And welcome to the Reality Revolution.